This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Connecticut Democrat Will Haskell talks about his book, 100,000 First Bosses, My Unlikely Path as a 22-Year-Old Lawmaker. He discusses his path to becoming a state senator and legislation he's worked on since being in office. It's about giving young people a seat at the table, not, not necessarily replacing all of the other valuable perspectives that currently have a say in public policy. Um, my generation doesn't have all the answers. Uh, when I go door to door and constituents who are older tell me about uh, taking out a mortgage, about helping to care for their elderly parents whose health is declining, about starting a small business in Connecticut, I spend a lot more time listening than I do talking because I personally, I don't have those experiences and I've got a lot to learn. He's interviewed by Millennial Action Project President and CEO, Layla Zaden. Senator Will Haskell, it is so great to see you again. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. Well, first off, congratulations on the publication of your new book, 100,000 First Bosses. Um, it is coming at a moment where I think we need to have hope for the next generation and how they will steward the future of our democracy. And I think you and I both share the belief that having more young people in politics is a good thing. Um, and yet you write in the opening pages of your book that it's not intended to be a roadmap for people running for office. So tell us, why did you write this book and what are you hoping that young people can take away from it? Absolutely. Well, first, let me say that I'm just so appreciative of the work that the Millennial Action Project does to get more elected officials at every level of government, because the promise of representative democracy is that every generation and every perspective has a voice as we craft public policy. But right now, our democracy isn't representative at all. Most stakeholders in the future don't have a seat at the table where decisions are made. And I think that's a huge problem. It's part of why I decided to run for office. And it's also a big part of why I decided to write this book. Um, you know, I've read a lot of other books by politicians, and sometimes their long campaign manifestos are like written down stump speeches, and those aren't very fun to read, and I imagine they're not very fun to write. I wanted to write a book that was a little bit more useful. As you said, it's not a how-to guide, because I'm not really qualified to write that. There are 1,938 state senate districts in the country. I only know what it's like to represent one of them. But... I wanted to provide a really honest, behind-the-scenes look mm -hmm. at what it means to run for office, what it feels like to make yourself vulnerable, vulnerable and put your name on the ballot. I wanted to show the good, the bad, the ugly, um, maybe occasionally the funny of local politics. So I talk about what it's like to hire my college roommate to be my campaign manager, to spend our spring break uh, hosting fundraisers instead of going to parties, to move into bunk beds because that was the only apartment we could afford in Fairfield County, uh, to earn the endorsement of President Obama, to fill our offices with beanbag chairs, and then fill those beanbag chairs with an army of young interns and volunteers, to get picked apart by a focus group for what I wear and what I say and the size of my earlobes and everything you could possibly imagine, and then ultimately, ultimately to flip a seat that nobody else thought we could win. So it's a behind-the-scenes look, and I hope that it inspires other people to launch their own campaign um, in their own hometown, to pursue public service in their own way and hopefully learn from the mistakes that I made and do more and do better. Yeah. Well, and I think what you say about writing something that feels fun to read, we really do feel like we're on this journey with you as we read the book. And it starts back at home, right, in Connecticut where you grew up. And for all of the things that you're frustrated about, that you want to change about the state, in a lot of ways the book reads like a love letter to your home state. And thinking about what you can do to help build the future of Connecticut that you believe is possible. Um, so what gave you um, the, the confidence to think, I'm the guy who can do this? And for so many people, they feel like they need permission. How did you end up giving yourself permission to consider it an option? That's such an interesting question. You know, I, I've met a lot of other candidates who tell me that they had a light bulb moment, an aha moment, where they decided that they were the right person to pursue public office, and this was the right time in their lives, and they knew exactly what they were going to do. I didn't have that at all. Um, in the book, I say I had a series of huh moments, and the first was President Trump's election, which um, felt like a punch in the gut. I had grown up in the Obama years. I was sort of... Uh, complacent with the idea that we were all moving in, a, in, in the same direction, that we were making progress, even if that progress was occasionally too slow. Um, 
And then Donald Trump's election came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, we had a president who was promising to make America great again, to, in explicit terms, pledging to his voters that he would bring us backwards. So that was a wake-up call and a, a, a victory on his part that I certainly didn't expect. And then the next uh, hump moment was President Obama's farewell address, where he said, if you're disappointed in your elected officials, grab a clipboard, get some signatures, and run for office yourself. I, that message resonated with me because I was really disappointed in my elected officials, not just at the national level, but I'd started to look into who was representing me at the state and town level. Because if President Trump was going to try to undo a lot of the progress of the Obama years, state governments were going to be the first line of defense. And I, my next huh moment was realizing that I was represented in the state Senate by somebody who I really disagreed with. And more importantly, somebody whose voting record I felt to be at odds with the values of my community. The next huh moment was realizing that she had been in office for longer than I'd been alive. And the final one, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, was learning that nobody else was going to run against her. Too often in down-ballot races, I'm sure you know this through your work as well, we, we concede um, local and state elections to the incumbents. We think that the people who happen to sit in those seats, whether it's in a state senate or, or on a local board or commission, belong to the people, to the people who are sitting there. But the reality is those seats belong to the people who show up on election day. And I felt it was time for a change. So I came back to Connecticut the morning after I graduated and I started knocking on doors. And I'm not sure I thought I was going to win, but I thought it was good for democracy that the incumbent be held accountable. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, surely you think that every incumbent ought to be forced to defend their voting record and to talk to voters about where they stand, to be honest and transparent about the work that they're doing on others' behalf. Yeah. And I think you're not alone in having had maybe a series of, I love that, huh, moments. And uh, Millennial Action Project actually tracked over the past election cycle a 266% increase in young people running for office between 2018 and 2020, a 266% increase. And it's quite remarkable given how opaque it is to actually run for office. It's really confusing and difficult for a first-time candidate out there to figure out what they have to do. And you mentioned just a few moments ago, right, hiring your, your college roommate to be part of that team. And um, that's often the first decision that candidates have to make is, who is the team that will surround me as I undertake this, this new initiative? And so how did you tackle that with battle untested uh, friends who had heart, political consultants who had experience with a price tag and finding that middle ground to find the perfect team for yourself. Experience with a price tag is exactly the right way to phrase (laughs) that. Our campaign was unconventional in every way. Uh, Jack had never worked on a campaign before and uh, but what he lacked in experience in politics, he made up for an experience dealing with me. We'd shared a room for four years and what you need in a campaign manager is somebody who understands you, can send tweets on your behalf and write checks on your behalf, somebody who you just trust implicitly. Um, the, the defining aspect of our team, though, was the fact that we had a lot of young people step forward, folks who had never voted in a, an election before, had never taken an interest in state politics, many people who weren't yet old enough to vote, deciding that they wanted to make politics their extracurricular activity. And it was so exciting to see that uh, 14, 15, 16-year-olds were coming in after school every day to lick envelopes, to call voters, to hang out with their friends. And our campaign offices, they became a social environment that was fun for young people. And as I got to know these remarkable teenagers who helped uh, propel us to victory, I came to understand why they were volunteering. And it was because for the first time, they recognized themselves and uh, the issues that they cared about in a candidate who was on the ballot. So often, young people are asked to get excited about candidates who um, talk about them instead of talking to them. Too often they're asked to work on campaigns that are marketed to young people as opposed to managed by young people. And um, there were just countless instances where uh, it was less about me and more about a generational excitement that they felt Gen Z was stepping off of the sidelines into the voting booth, that young people weren't just going to be at the ballot in this election but they were going to be on the ballot as well. And that was something that was really special. But I shouldn't discount, too, uh, the intergenerational energy in our Mm -hmm. office. The coolest day for me, we had these uh, weekly Telephone Tuesday events. We asked people to come in, you know, 5 to 8 p.m. or something. We ordered a lot of pizza from the restaurant next door. And um, 
you know, one day there was a 15-year-old volunteer signing letters and licking envelopes right next to uh, a volunteer who had once voted for FDR. And wow. um, seeing their friendship blossom over the course of this campaign, seeing them laughing together, working together, it was really special. It made me realize that it isn't just young people who are excited about sending Gen Z into the halls of power. It's also folks in my grandparents' generation who believed wholeheartedly in President Kennedy's long overdue promise about passing the torch to the next generation. That promise still hasn't been fulfilled, but we were lucky to have some amazing volunteers of all ages. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you actually busted two myths right there, because the first is that uh, young people are apathetic. And I think that's just not true. As you mentioned, young people are really hopeful and want to be engaged. And it's really about finding the way to engage them and to, to listen to them and talk with them instead of talking about them, as you mentioned. The other myth is that advocating for more participation among young people means that we've written off the value of intergenerational collaboration, the wisdom of our elders, the energy of other generations and working together to solve a common goal. And so in your campaigning, you obviously represent more than just young people. Your constituents are all ages. And so can you talk a little bit about how you were able to resonate not just to young people who saw themselves in you, but to older voters as well, that um, you perhaps had to convince a little bit at first about your experience and your ability to lead? Absolutely. Um, well, I think Millennial Action Project does a great job of threading that needle. It's about giving young people a seat at the table, not, not necessarily replacing all of the other valuable perspectives that currently have a say in public policy. Um, my generation doesn't have all the answers. Uh, when I go door to door and constituents who are older tell me about uh, taking out a mortgage, about helping to care for their elderly parents whose health is declining, about starting a small business in Connecticut, I spend a lot more time listening than I do talking because I personally, I don't have those experiences and I've got a lot to learn from both the folks I represent and then the folks who I work alongside in Hartford who bring that different perspective. Conversely, I think I bring a lot to the table when we're talking about college affordability because young people know how hard it is to afford a degree in the 21st century. I, um, I think I bring a unique, unique perspective when we're talking about climate change because it's our generation that understands that rising global temperatures aren't some academic problem. They're an existential threat to our ability to lead happy and healthy lives. When I made it to the Senate, I was appointed the Senate Chairman of the Higher Education Committee. We got to talk about issues like consent on college campuses. Having just graduated from school recently, I know what it looks like on a Friday night on a college campus, what consent ought to look like and sometimes what it doesn't look like. And finally, the one that I hear the most feedback from young voters about is uh, school safety and gun violence prevention. We're a generation that knows what it's like to hear a loud noise in the hallway and worry about where we would hide in the event that the next Parkland or Sandy Hook arrived in our high school. That's a unique perspective that's different from anything that my parents or grandparents' generation experienced. Mm -hmm. All that to say that it's not about replacing one perspective or another. It's about making sure that everyone gets a say as the laws are written, that everybody has a seat at the table. That's the promise of representative democracy, and it's a promise that's unfulfilled every day. I mean, walk into any state capital. You can pick Hartford. I know you were in Kansas recently. You can go to any state capital in the country, and you will see that uh, the next century of American life is being talked about and decided upon without any input from the stakeholders in that future, without any input from the taxpayers of tomorrow. I think that's a real problem. Right. If you're uh, not at the table, you're on the menu. Right. That's right. the that's the saying. And and I think you know you bring up a good point of having the energy behind you. Right. Of the the people who believe in your passion, in your vision. We talked about some of the mechanics of getting a campaign started, and part of that is is building a team around you. Part of that is raising money. And for most candidates, it's their least favorite part of the job: fundraising. And I think in the book, you, you describe a scene where you launch your campaign in your dorm room and completely just tap into what was, I think, for, for you at the time, an, an impossible sum that you raised specifically from, from young people. But that really kickstarted your campaign on a, on a very high note. Can you tell us a little bit about 
um, maybe that moment in particular, but then more broadly, how you were able to, to raise the money um, to compete in this campaign. Absolutely. Uh, it, it was one of my favorite moments of the campaign, and it's one of my favorite moments in this book. Shortly before spring break, Jack and I launched our campaign. We've got a string of fundraisers set up in Connecticut, and we thought maybe we'll host a fundraiser here in our college dorm and invite folks to swing by, and maybe they'll donate, but it's a bunch of broke college students, so probably <laughs> they won't. Um, overall, we'll just fill people in on what we plan to do after graduation. We created this thermometer on the wall, and it, it capped out at $300. That was our very modest fundraising goal. Um, by the end of the evening, it, the room was filled with people who I knew on campus and a lot of people who I didn't. And within the first 15 minutes, we'd exceeded that $300 goal. By the end of the night, we raised $8,000. Wow. And again, that's, it's, it's not easy to ask college students to, to donate money to a political campaign. But it speaks to that excitement that they had that somebody from their generation, 300 miles away in Connecticut or more, was going to actually impact public policy. Uh, that, was, that was a wake-up call to me and something that became a defining feature of our campaign later on. But in the spirit of honesty, because that is the, the core goal of this book, we should talk about money. There are great things in Connecticut about being a young person in politics, uh, especially as it relates to campaign finance. And then there are terrible things with, with regard to how much public servants are paid. So we're really lucky in Connecticut to have something called the Citizens' Election Program. And without it, I would have never been able to afford to run for office. It says that so long as you raise a certain amount of money from people who live in your district, then you qualify for public financing. You get a grant, a pretty sizable one. And you can't spend a penny more than the amount of money that you're given by the state. And the same is true for your opponent. So what's so amazing is that I was 22 years old running against a 22-year incumbent, and yet we had the same resources. It was a question of who was going to spend those resources more effectively and more strategically. But it wasn't a question of who had more wealthy and well-connected friends, who had a bigger bank account that they could pour into their own uh, campaign coffers. Um, all of these things that across the country make our political system so dysfunctional by, you know, uh, giving an a unfair advantage to those who are personally wealthy, that's off the table in Connecticut, at least on the legislative level. And I think that was a huge reason why I was able to run and a huge reason why we were able to win. Um, after I was elected, I talk in this book very honestly about the challenge of affording rent on a state senator's salary. We haven't increased the salary of a state senator in, in, uh, since 2001. And because of inflation, it's effectively shrunk. And Connecticut's right smack dab in the middle. We earn $29,000 a year. That means we rank 20th nationally when it comes to state pay. And um, look, nobody should get rich from serving in state government. But on $29,000 a year, it's really hard to afford rent in Fairfield County. And for some of my older colleagues, it's hard for them to put their kids through school, to put food on the table, to pay their bills. All that to say that as we seek to build a more representative democracy, we wring our hands and wonder why there aren't more women in office, why there aren't more people of color in office, why there aren't more young people in office. Well, a big part of it is that it's only a small, small group of people who can afford to pursue public service. Mm -hmm. The legislature is filled with folks who made a lot of money in the private sector, and now they're making a quasi-retirement turn towards public service. They bring a really important perspective, but it shouldn't be the only perspective, right? We need more people who... Are maybe are from working class backgrounds um, who can afford to to serve in the state senate. So it's not a popular thing to say that politicians should get a pay increase, right? I I know that that's not going to win a lot of votes in the next election on it for any candidate who puts that on their flyer. But it's important. It's an important conversation about our democracy as to who can actually afford to pursue public service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I want to come back to that point in a few minutes because I think it's so important about diversifying the legislature in every dimension and what are some of the tactical ideas to ensure that new non-traditional candidates who are winning are able to actually make an impact. And so we'll come back to that point in just a minute. But I do want to ask you about the public financing in, in Connecticut and your, um, your opinion on how it has diversified the electorate, the, both the electorate and the candidate pool. And are you seeing that over time more and more young people, people of color, women, are choosing to run? Or are you seeing that um, because of the circumstances of actually being a state legislature, being a state legislator, 
we're not really getting that, that diversity of candidates. It's a little bit of both, yeah. right? Every, a part of why I decided to write 100,000 First Bosses is because every so often I get a call from a young person who wants to launch their campaign. And sometimes they're in Connecticut and I get to share the great news with them because they, they admit right off the bat, hey, I don't have a lot of money in my bank account and I don't have a lot of wealthy friends and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to compete mm -hmm. in this race. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to afford to put an ad on TV. And I give them the great news that don't worry, so long as you can find 300 people to write you $50, $50 checks, you're going to be in the clear and you're going to be on an equal playing field. That's huge. But when somebody calls me, which happens every so often from Alabama, from Florida, from Texas, telling me that they want to run for office there, and sometimes it's for the state senate, sometimes it's for a, uh, the local school board, um, and they want to know about our campaign and sort of some of the lessons that I learned, I hear from them about how overwhelmed they are about the fundraising challenges, how they're going to have to spend the next few months asking everybody they meet for a check. The great thing in Connecticut is as soon as we had raised that money, I stopped asking for checks and I started asking for votes. And yeah. it's, it's a far better way to campaign. And I think there are only six states in the country that have publicly financed state legislative elections. I hope that in Connecticut folks can see that it's working really well. Um, but to your question, what prevents people from running for office? It's not just the fundraising on the campaign. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to pay their bills even after they're elected. And a lot of folks I know, I, I've had wonderful conversations with Jessica Post, the executive director of the DLCC. She goes around the country trying to recruit a diverse slate of candidates to fill uh, state legislatures. But she, she struggles with recruitment because of child care uh, issues that folks face, um, because of the time commitment of being a legislator. Mm -hmm. But I think a huge reason is the pay, um, the pay cut um, that many people will need to take in order to become a public servant. And again, Nobody should go into this to get rich, but if we, my colleague Norm Needleman is a, a great example. He's a wonderful friend. He's somebody who made a lot of money in the private sector and turned towards public service, and he's, he's comfortable enough in his own finances that he, I don't think he accepts a salary. He's the only one brave enough to say, you get what you pay for, and if Connecticut isn't going to pay their legislators a little bit more, well then, sadly, we're going to get what we pay for, which is a democracy that isn't inclusive of um, folks from all walks of life. So you launched this incredible outsider campaign. You raised money in part because of the enthusiasm of young people, in part because of the conditions in, in Connecticut that enable that kind of a campaign, and you win. Governing is very different from campaigning, and campaigning while in office is also very different from campaigning while an outsider. And so tell us a little bit about what you learned from those different stages of, of being inside the political machine and what that transition from campaigning to governing was like for you. Oh, my gosh. It was uh, so overwhelming. <laughs> for one thing, you know, people who live and work at the Capitol their whole lives don't realize how strange it is for an outsider to walk into that place. And what I mean by that is you're scheduled uh, immediately on a whole bunch of different committees that meet at the exact same time. So while you came to Hartford to work on three, four, five issues that are really important to you and to the constituents you represent, you're suddenly asked to vote on 400 issues. And it, in order to cast an informed vote, you've got to spend a lot of time reading and researching. The challenge is you're being pulled in a million different directions. While you're sitting in the Transportation Committee talking about how to repair bridges and speed up mass transit, there are really important votes taking place in the Judiciary Committee about gun violence prevention bills that were so important to the young volunteers who helped you win this office in the first place. And meanwhile, you're trying to chair a committee meeting in the Higher Education uh, Committee where we're talking about how to bring free community college to Connecticut. And all of this is literally happening at the same time. So you're sitting in one room, you're watching another meeting on your screen, and you're watching it on, on your iPhone, and you're watching another meeting on your laptop, and you've got two different headphones in, and it's incredibly hectic. And all that to say that um, I think from the outside, people assume that public policy is written by a bunch of PhDs who know everything about everything. Um, and I love my colleagues. I've, I <laughs> feel so grateful to, to work alongside them, and I've learned a lot from them. But that's absolutely not the case, right? <laughs> Politicians are ordinary people, just trying to do their best, trying to, um, to vote in a way that's consistent with their own values and the values of the communities that sent them to the Capitol. And uh, to the extent that folks are sheepish about getting their name on the ballot, are hesitant to run for office because they, 
have bought into this Aaron Sorkin myth that you have to, in order to be the president of the United States, you have to juggle multiple games of chess while dealing with an international crisis. I think that our politics would be more functional. More people would run for office if they realized they didn't have to be otherworldly brilliant. They just have to be smart and competent and, most importantly, willing to work hard and listen and learn. Um, that's what it takes to be a state legislator. And it is a hard adjustment at first, but more people could do this job, and therefore more people should do this job. You make a lot of references in the book to the West Wing, and I, I understand that you had to actually remove some per your, your fiancé's uh, <laughs> request, but I think for folks who, who do sort of think about the ability of a president or an elected leader as, as you say, otherworldly brilliant, it's quite inspiring to hear you describe yourself as an ordinary person who is there to, to do their best, their best, listen to the community and solve problems. And for ordinary people, when they start a new job, they get a training manual, they have onboarding, they have a support system to help them acclimate into their new roles and responsibilities. What are the resources that you get as a new legislator? There's definitely no training manual. <laughs> uh, it was the weirdest onboarding process of all time. It was my first job out of college, and it felt a little bit like college, frankly, on the first day, because I show up with the fellow freshmen, folks who had just been elected. There were a lot of them. Uh, because 2018 was such a year, as you mentioned earlier, for cat a catalyst for change. Um, and we stand in line to get our ID badges. We learn where we're supposed to sit. We get our schedules, meeting our committee assignments, and of course when they're meeting. And in that way, it felt a little bit like college. But the, the challenge for me was figuring out, and I, I allude to this uh, in, the, in the title of the book, 100,000 First Bosses, how to live up to the promises and expectations um, that were established on the campaign trail. I was elected by a majority of folks who showed up to the ballot, but only barely. That meant I knew on my very first day that uh, thousands of people in my district didn't think I was up for this job. And to be honest, in the first few weeks, I wasn't sure if I was up for this job because it all felt so overwhelming. I was really lucky to have a great uh, staff. I talk a lot about Alex Romanowitz, who is my, is my legislative aide and helps to keep my life on track. But it's a foreign thing to have somebody else take over your schedule, right? That's not, not something that uh, any 22-year-old is, is used to doing. Um, all that to say that uh, it was an adventure. It was a really steep learning curve. But I came to realize that on the campaign trail, we wanted to make everybody happy, right? The goal was to win votes, and therefore, um, you wanted to just be making friends from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. Governing is much different, right? The votes aren't as black and white as we make them seem in the rhetoric of campaigning. Most things fall in a gray area. There are pluses and minuses to every decision that you're asked to make. And sometimes your job as an elected official is to disappoint your friends, to disappoint the people who gave you this opportunity to serve. That was a really weird adjustment to make, um, one that I eventually got used to probably got a little bit better at it in my second term in office than my first. Mm -hmm. but, um, but trying to answer to 100,000 people, recognizing that you were never going to make them all ha happy, and having all 100,000 of those feel like your very first boss, because mm -hmm. um, everybody's eager to please their first boss, right? <laughs> right, right. Is there, is there a moment that you're, you're really proud of that you were able to navigate this gray area work potentially across the aisle or build sort of support on, in your caucus to get something done that um, really makes you recommit to the idea of running for office and, and being an elected leader, something you're proud of? Yeah, I guess I'll say two things. One is that I'm really proud of the work that's happening at the state level, and this isn't exclusive to Connecticut. Across the country, there are big things happening in state capitals that folks largely aren't paying attention to. And who am I to judge, right? I grew up not knowing who my state senator was. People lead busy lives. If they're able to pay attention to politics in Washington, if they're able to follow what's happening at the White House, they probably don't have time to follow what's happening uh, under the Capitol Dome in their own state. That being said, um, while Washington is talking about problems, state governments, they're actually solving some of them. So we're all wringing our hands about what's going to happen to free community college and paid family leave. Now that uh, senators like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema have stripped that out of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. But the good news is, at the state level, these policies are moving forward. Here in Connecticut, uh, paid family and medical leave came into effect just this month. 
And for the first time, new parents are going to be eligible to spend time with their newborns, to bond with them without having to give up a paycheck. Thousands of students have already pursued a degree at their local community college campus because uh, that degree is being offered debt-free thanks to a program that I helped to write. That's providing a, a, a life-changing opportunity for young people in Connecticut. And I think I, I personally am really inspired by what Justice Brandeis once said, that states can be laboratories of democracy. We can be a testing ground for progressive ideas that maybe don't have enough votes yet to pass at the national level, but we can prove that they're working really well in states like Connecticut and hopefully build a record of success that allows for Congress in the future to take up these issues. I do just want to tell one story about an issue that, um, where we weren't able to make some progress initially and, and that sort of, in my mind, epitomizes that gray area. Um, I remember I spent Memorial Day weekend in 2019 marching in a parade in my hometown of Westport, and I walked alongside a lot of EMT crews. And they told me about some of the tragedies that they encounter in the back of that van. They told me about watching kids take their very last breaths uh, during an ambulance ride to the hospital. They talk about um, being unable to forget the images of, of walking into Sandy Hook, for example. Some of them were, were first responders to that incident. And um, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress in this country, but we focus on veterans. Um, understandably, there are a lot of folks who return from war overseas and, uh, and are impacted in a big way, and their mental health, it takes a toll on their mental health. But there are also folks in our community in uniform who um, we don't always give the same resources um, to address those, those mental health challenges. Anyways, we got to Hartford about a week later, and uh, we're voting on a bill that would expand post-traumatic stress coverage and protections and resources for uh, first responders. The problem was the bill was uh, geared towards firefighters and police officers who are absolutely deserving of these protections, but it didn't include EMTs. And I had just promised a whole bunch of EMTs in my district that I was going to fight for them to extend these protections, to, to make sure that they had coverage uh, when, when an incident stayed with them after the sh their shift ended. Um, I could have voted no on the bill because it didn't include EMTs, but that felt like the wrong thing to do to the police officers and firefighters who deserved the coverage. And I could have voted yes, but that felt like I was kicking sand in the face of the EMT workers who i just gotten to know. And I honestly did not know what to do. So I stepped out into the uh, hallway and I placed a call to an EMT worker in my district, a, a great guy named, who I'd gotten to know named Mike. And I asked him very honestly, what would you do? Of course, he was really frustrated. He couldn't believe that they'd been left out of the bill. Um, but after a long pause and a deep breath, he said, I guess I would vote for it so long as you can push to include EMTs in the future. And that's what I did. I ended up voting in favor of it. And when we returned to the Capitol the next year, we fought like hell to make sure that EMT workers would be included. And I'm really proud that now they finally are in Connecticut. Sometimes progress is incremental, and that's an example maybe of disappointing your friends and it being your job to do so and navigating this gray area of um, decisions being both right and wrong. It's incredibly challenging to, to be a leader and to have to confront those kinds of gut-wrenching decisions day in and day out and have to do the best that you can to do the most good for the most people. And I think in the book, you really bring us behind the scenes of several of these moments where you fight like hell to, to get something done for your constituents. In thinking about how sometimes things don't go your way, you talk about um, a couple of different pieces of legislation, uh, one of which it was the um, conversation to regulate ghost guns. And you recount this, this scenario where the Democratic caucus and the Republican caucus are really going at it in, uh, you know, on the floor in the committee room. And you walk out and go to get some pizza and you see Democrats and Republicans chumming it up, just having a grand old time, having sort of a, a nice lunch together. And similarly, on your last day of your first legislative session, you were somewhat surprised to see the, the way in which people across the political spectrum were celebrating together, despite the policy victories or failures that they had experienced in that legislative session. And so I don't know if, if, I, if I really understood at the end of the book where you landed on whether that approach was appropriate or not to 
have that kind of relationship despite some of the real policy differences that that you experience and you know i wonder since writing the book and and now in this in this very hyper partisan moment how should legislators be thinking about delivering wins for their constituents while also maintaining relationships with other legislators in the in the state house well it's something that i i struggle with constantly because on the campaign trail you're just geared to think of I, Democrats as being your friends and Republicans as being your enemy or vice versa if you belong to the other party. And if you watch cable news, you're geared towards thinking that, you know, one party wakes up every morning and eats children for breakfast and the other party is trying to save the country and the planet maybe. Uh, Of course, that's not the reality when you're actually elected. There are Democrats with whom I strongly disagree on some issues and there are Republicans who it's a joy to work alongside. Um, there are some hyperpartisan moments in Hartford, not as many as, uh, as in Washington. Actually, about 80% of the bills that we pass in the Senate are bipartisan. People don't know that because it doesn't make the headlines, but it's worth saying because that, that should make everybody feel a little bit more optimistic about our democracy. Um, anyways, when I think about those moments behind the scenes, as, as you described in the book, where we're eating pizza together or where we're cheersing um, at the end of the legislative session, I honestly struggled with folks who, you know, becoming good friends with folks who had a drastically different vision for the future and, and a different vision of who should get to share in that future. It's my job to compromise. It's my job to get things done for constituents, to work across the aisle. And sometimes that bipartisanship is worth celebrating because we come together, share ideas, and come up with a product that, that really, um, you know, can be supported by both sides and does a lot of good. But sometimes partisanship ends up blocking really important things. I talk in the bill about some of the failures, um, that, uh, some of the bills that we didn't get across the finish line. One that became near and dear to my heart was prison telecommunications. Connecticut had some of the most expensive prison phone calls in the country. I didn't know that prior to running for office. This is one example where the more you listen and the more you learn in Hartford, the more fired up you become about new issues. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was actually sending families into debt to be able to keep in touch with their loved ones. And not only is that inhumane and heartless, but it's also just bad for recidivism, right? We want people to keep in, touch, in close touch with the people that they love and with their family and their friends so that when they f- complete their term of incarceration, when they're back, as, back into the real world, they have a supportive network to lean on to help them find a job and housing and all of that. When we make it prohibitively expensive for them to keep in touch with folks on the outside, well, then we're just sending them into a cycle of recidivism. Anyways, we fought so hard to make prison phone calls free in Connecticut in the 2019 session. I was only a small part of that fight. It was led by people like Josh Elliott and Gary Winfield and other colleagues. Um, and it was blocked by some of our Republican colleagues. And it was really hard to build friendships with those folks who were actively separating families, making it harder for families to, to keep in close touch. Um, so I do struggle with it. To, to your question as to where I land, I'm not entirely sure. Yes, I've, I've got Republican friends who I've worked with and compromised alongside and have, am, am proud of the work we've done together, and I consider them friends. But I also find it challenging to sit back and go into a side room after fighting like crazy on the Senate floor to share pizza together because um, we're fighting for drastically different futures. Well, one way that I know that you're trying to shift the axis of how you solve problems, uh, in Connecticut at least, is through the Connecticut Future Caucus, which was started through Millennial Action Project and which connects young Democrats and young Republicans along a generational line to bridge the partisan divide and, as you say, think about the, the future. And I'm curious how, since seeing more and more young people step into office, if you're seeing a different approach to policymaking among the next generation of policymakers like yourself, either in terms of the types of issues being debated or brought up, or even how we co-create solutions to tackle the problems that are going to impact our generation. Absolutely. The Futures Caucus is amazing. (laughs) I'm only a small part of it. Uh, The the leadership, uh, uh, Representative Leeper, um, Representative Carney, so many others in the, the Capitol who take a lead on bringing the millennial perspective into the policymaking process. Uh, it, it plays out in a number of great ways. One, they, they refocus issues, Democrats and Republicans, to say this is important for Connecticut's future. One big thing that we talk about is 
how to retain a 21st century workforce in Connecticut. We do a really good job of educating students. We've got some of the best K through 12 schools in the country. We've got some of the best higher ed institutions from UConn to Yale to Wesleyan to Norwalk Community College and everything uh, in between. The problem is so many of those students earn their degrees and then they pick up and leave. They start their careers elsewhere. They start their small businesses, their families. They buy their first home elsewhere. Um, how do we keep more young people in Connecticut? It's a really pressing economic question for our state. And it's a question that I think is best answered by young legislators who have a sense of what young people are looking for. So it's been an honor to work with the Futures Caucus on policy issues. But I also want to say that um, something I really appreciated about, about getting to know other young colleagues who pursued public office in the same way that I did, um, they bring a different approach to how they serve their constituents, right? It's not just about sending out a flyer in the mail every few months, which, by the way, is important, right? That's how a lot of older constituents keep in touch with what their elected officials are doing. But it's also about being accessible to the people that we represent, to our 100,000 bosses, right? I gave out my cell phone number in my very first campaign ad because I believe that anyone who I work for, who I'm in charge of representing, should be able to get in touch with me and share their opinion. And it's shocking how few people, frankly, are in touch with their state elected officials. If, if even 1% of the activism that we direct towards Washington, D.C. and towards Mitch McConnell, say, was instead directed at state legislators, we could do transformative things for our country and for our communities. Um, but being accessible, hosting town hall meetings, going to senior centers, which is important because, of course, seniors vote, but also going to high school classrooms, even if they're not old enough to vote, because that because you take young people seriously and you want to hear their ideas for the future. Anyways, the, the Futures Caucus does a great job of um, sharing ideas for outreach opportunities. Hey, I just did this Instagram Live, and it's a great way to answer questions. Mm. Hey, I just did this, um, you know, uh, I just got a Snapchat, and I'm figuring out how to campaign via TikTok. I'm not saying I'm very good at any of these things. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure them out, but I'm always looking weird as a... Futures Caucus, always looking for new ways to reach the people that we represent. Yeah. And it's interesting how you bring up the idea of investing in the future workforce of Connecticut with one of the policy issues that you're thinking about for the long term. Um, I mentioned I was just with some young legislators in Kansas last night, and that was an issue that they were grappling with in their state as well. And you talk a little bit about this in the book, and you just mentioned right now, investing in long-term solutions that millennials and Gen Z will have to bear the consequences of is inherently a benefit of having younger policymakers in the state house. And so you're in the unique position of being a politician, an elected official who has to think for the short term because you do have to run for office and convince your 100,000 bosses that you can deliver results for them. And that means getting some short-term wins. But you also want to solve these big, intractable problems that will become an even bigger crisis if left unaddressed. And you are at the unique intersection of being both an elected official and a young person who needs, who's incentivized to solve problems in the short term, but who's also incentivized to solve problems for the long term. And how have you balance those two competing or complementary incentives? Um, I, I, I love that you, you frame it in that way. Uh, one way that I often think about it is which electorate we are catering towards, right? It, uh, politicians, I think, of both parties are pretty smart in the sense that they know who's going to vote, and they know who's going to vote in the next election, and that's who they are geared towards pleasing. So that's why it's no coincidence that a lot of them go to senior centers or focus on retirement security or issues that are important to older constituents because older constituents vote. Younger constituents more and more are voting, but not nearly at the same rate. That's starting to change. We saw 36% turnout nationally for, for 18 to 24-year-olds in the 2018 election. It grew to 55%. In the 2020 election, that was a 10-point increase from the last presidential election. So young people are starting to show up at the polls in a meaningful way, and I think that that will change how politicians order their priorities. I think we'll start to see elected officials of all ages and in all communities start to recognize that young voters are a core part of the voting coalition, of any winning coalition, and therefore they've got to orient their message accordingly. But it is a challenge to try to make seniors happy and to try to make... Um, 
to try to make the, the youngest voters happy and to try to pass near-term wins and long-term wins. One that I focused on a lot was higher education because I view this as both, right? It's a near-term win when somebody in Connecticut who doesn't think that they can afford a degree all of a sudden has the opportunity to go to a community college. We know that in Connecticut, about 70% of jobs are going to require some degree beyond a high school diploma by 2025. Uh, that's, that's a lot of jobs that we're not currently prepared to fill. It means we need 300,000 more college graduates over the next few years. So in order to get more students to enroll and, at their local campus and to get that degree, we decided to tear down the barrier of affordability. And in the short term, it's going to change a lot of lives for young people because they're going to be able to get that degree and get a higher paying job and become a Connecticut taxpayer. And by the way, if they go to community college, they're more likely to stick around in Connecticut. So those are all short-term wins. But in the long term, the advanced manufacturing company that's in my district that struggles to fill job openings because they can't find a young, diverse, tech-savvy workforce in Connecticut, we're now going to be churning out more graduates who are going to fill those jobs. And that's a long-term win for Connecticut's economy. So some of these investments, I hope, check both boxes. Well, Senator Haskell, it has been a wonderful conversation. I am so thrilled to see this book finally hit bookshelves. It is such an important time to be talking about the power of young people in elected office. And I think a lot of people are going to be inspired by the honesty and the transparency of the story that you've shared. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for the great work that the Millennial Action Project does. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. Music.